Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 121st episode of the Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bodie, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Roger Bodie, because Roger Bodie had laryngitis this week and was unable to record an episode of the podcast up until today. And by that time, Michael had already left for Portland. So he and I could not arrange a time uh, between now and when I got better to sit down and spend 30 minutes talking, unfortunately, because Michael is just that busy all the time, on the, always on the go, 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 nonstop. So it's just going to be me for a little while. I don't know how long this episode's going to go, especially considering that it was just uh, not but two days ago that I couldn't talk at all. The laryngitis was really bad. It was... Uh, playing in the battle hard last weekend. And I literally had a note that I held up to all my opponents that said, hi, I'm Roger. I can't talk. If I'm going to pass priority, I'm going to give you a thumbs up. My voice is feeling rather hoarse, but don't worry. I don't have a fever and I'm feeling fine otherwise. And so I just would be like, I just have to do a lot of mannerisms. And I got through it. Got through it and got to the top eight and all the way until the top eight where I used the last of my voice that that sealed the deal for me, not being able to talk for the next three days, basically. The very last, last rasps of my voice were used to yell at Michael in top eight because I'm sitting there at two life total points or something like two, either two or four, some, some arbitrarily low life total. And he's at 18 and he's tanking and tanking and tanking and tank. Like he spends like five minutes tanking, like on this turn of the game. And I just, I, I can't believe like it's, it's taking him like his hand must be really bad. Like it must be like, he must like have like a total brick, right? No, he has uh, become the Ark Knight, discard an attack action, go get revel and kill me. And it's like, okay, cool. I love being slow rolled by my best friend for five minutes. Like that, that feels really good. And we talked through the, I used also the last in my voice to talk through the lines with him. And it just he, uh, he he was like, well, if you have very specifically and two blues left in your hand and and this and that, you can live through the turn at one. And it's like, okay. And then I have AB one, and you have Rosetta Thorn, and you're at eighteen. How does the how do you lose this game from here? So I don't know. So I was rather tilted at that point in time, and. Uh, It could get me into a little bit. Maybe I'll talk about this again with Michael at some point, but Michael's my best friend, 100%. Say that every week, not close. Uh, Well, my wife's also my best friend and my son's also my best friend. So I got a lot of best friends going on, I guess. But he's also my biggest rival. And there's a, a brotherly aspect to the relationship between Michael and I where Yes, he is a phenomenal card game player, and I enjoy playing card games with him. But it's not like I like getting beat up by him 100% of the time when we play card games. And I don't lose 100% of the time. You know, I beat him in the pro quest. But even when I beat him in the pro quest, I think longtime listeners will realize, they'll say, yeah, but I punted that game. I could have taken a different line and maybe won. So even he was having a little bit of difficulty, I feel like, admitting that I, the lowly Roger Bodie, was having, uh, was was capable of beating him that day. And so I don't like losing in general. I don't think anybody does. Nobody plays card games to lose, but you, you obviously have to be a, a respectful adult about it. But Losing to Michael in top level professional settings even hurts because I know that, you know, if I do win, I also get that extra level of validation from, you know, beating the ultimate final boss, Michael Hamilton. Like I get the extra one up on him, you know, in our brotherly rivalry of competition that is very one sided up until this point. So I don't know if there's ever anything that I could do to close that rivalry. Probably it's a, it's a tough hill to climb, but you know, I was talking to some other people and they were saying, I think I've identified a leak in your game. It's that you go to a lot of tournaments with Michael Hamilton. And uh, that is a pretty, uh, 
major downside to traveling with him is that when you go to tournaments with Michael Hamilton, lo and behold, in the top eight, there's a uh, Michael Hamilton in the top eight. So got to figure out how better game plan into him consistently, which is hard considering, you know, he's obviously one of the best, if not arguably the best flesh and blood player in the world, depending on how dedicated he's feeling at that given time. But that was my weekend uh, in flesh and blood. Michael obviously top eight on Viscera. I was on Starvo. I can talk about Starvo a little bit. So leading up to the event, I was uh, doing my standard million te- testing team questions of just asking anybody and anybody who wants to work on Starvo because I guess on the on what I would consider to be like my my base I guess I have like two base teams now. So like I post a lot in the Wolfpack and I post a lot in APC uh Discord. Those are like the two main t- testing team discords I'm most active in at the moment. And so I post in ABC and nobody's really caring about Starvo right now. They're all preparing for Portland and so I don't really have anybody to talk to there about the deck. And then I post in the Wolfpack Discord and like I'll get a little bit of interest. And to their credit, to their credit, they did say, hey, your list looks a little soft to CYB Oldheim, maybe throw in some Evergreens. So I did I did listen to that feedback and I played three red Evergreens instead of three red earth forms. And that paid big dividends. And so I'm like, hmm. I know a lot of people, right? You know, I got I got my I got my podcast clout, right? So I messaged Lucas Oswald and he and I have never like collaborated or anything in the past, but you know, I I do have his Discord. He was a patron for a while and so hit him up and I was like, "Hey, I want to play Starvo. This is my Starvo list. What do you think?" And he's like, "This is garbage." I was like, "Dang." Well, how do I fix like your list a little bit? And we start, we talked through slots. I wound up tweaking some things and Lucas gave a lot of good feedback that I was bouncing ideas off of basically, because it's just nice to have somebody that could be like, Hey, I have this crazy off the wall idea. What do you think about that? They're like, no, that's a horrible idea, Roger. Why would you ever put channel Mount heroic in Starvo? And then I'm like, okay, well, what about cutting lightning surge? And Lucas was like, I think you could cut lightning surge. That seems like a very cuttable card. So I'm like, sweet lightning surge out of here. I hate you, lightning surge. Not easily the worst card in the deck up until that point i felt like it's just not what the game plan's about out of here and so that got replaced with uh red arctic incarceration because the nice thing about red arctic incarceration is that you can uh, pitch it and another ice card if you have a channel like frigid around to hammer and then you boom bada bing bada boom you get another turn out of your channel like frigid and there are decks like Ch- uh, zen and kind of like chain as well where they have really good defensive options and you need ways to disrupt them without attacking them and arctic incarceration kind of fills that niche well especially while maintaining your elemental thresholds because you have to play a million ice lightning and earth cards in order to do the starbo thing so really liked it there i thought it was a solid include i'll probably keep it in the deck for a while longer but now that i have my little taste of starvo there's lots of i have like 20 maybe cards sitting in my deck right now so i'll definitely make some changes to it i just don't know how far i necessarily want to go with it but we'll see but circling all the way back around to count your blessings starvo i did play against pat eggsy uh becoming a, a frequent favorite of mine to play against in tournaments where uh, he was on Count Your Blessing, Starvo, and we're playing our game. And I look back at the clock, and there's 30 minutes left. And I'm like, oh, crap. I have to start going. I like, <laughs> I, like I, I saw 30 minutes on the clock, and I was like, nope. But we got to play like there's 30 seconds on the clock. So I'm like, we're both playing really fast, throwing cards everywhere, doing this and that and this and that. And uh, thankfully, one of the cards that Lucas uh, said wasn't crazy also recommended to me was Exposed to Elements. And I was able to in my haste pick up a situation where uh he didn't have any cards in arsenal no tunic up he just pitched uh, a nice card to swing hammer at me and then in response i didn't have the earth card to go with it uh but i played exposed to blow up uh, his crown of seeds and between blowing up his crown of seeds and having the three red evergreen i uh i was able to have not win the game i didn't win the game outright 
we had time was called and uh pat had no cards left in, in deck he was on the same like four or five cards which doesn't necessarily mean he's, he's dead right because i'm at four five four or five and he is still at like 18 and the problem my my i know my pitch deck right I know I have red evergreen lightning ice. Like I, I just have all these starvo activations where I'm going to be able to kill him in two turns and there's nothing he can really do about it. But I can't, I can't tell him that, right? Because when time's called, you can't, there's no more talking to your opponents. And uh, you're about like the game states. There's very, it's a very weird situation when it's time called. So I have to, I just have to let Pat sit and and stew and think and think and think and think like is he determined is he actually dead is he actually dead he doesn't know um he could know but obviously in our haste like we're not like perfect tracking each other's pitch tracks or anything like that and i'm thinking you know pat's not going to concede to me here uh and this is the second last round we're both x1 so a draw effectively would have knocked us both the top uh, out of top eight i was like just to like just to payback i was i was thinking back to the whole bluff thing and i was like there's no way he's gonna do anything nice for me after the whole bluff camera fiasco and maybe maybe that was the whole reason to not bluff people is that if you ever run into them later down the line they'll they'll they're, they're not inclined to do you any favors if you make them look silly um not that he looks silly but yeah uh but you, you wound up uh realizing that he was dead and and shook my hand so appreciate that uh and i actually had a good time playing uh not werewolf Blood on the Clock Tower. It's like a weird spinoff. It was me and a bunch of other guys after that event uh, playing that. Pat was there. And Pat was really good at Blood on the Clock Tower as well. So uh, I like Pat quite a bit. And uh, definitely, I, I think I own like five or six now, I said, after the event. So just wanted to share that amusing anecdote out of the tournament. But I think that's all I have to say about Living Legend. If I was playing in Portland... I'd probably be playing some kind of new deck. I haven't looked at Class Constructed because since I'm not playing in Portland, I haven't had any, any reason to test or care about Class Constructed. It's just been all Living Legend up until this point in time. And uh, we'll continue to be Living Legend uh, all the way through Chicago coming up here in a couple weeks. And what's nice is... <coughs> Excuse me. What's nice is that since I don't know anything about the new set, obviously still, we none of us do, and this format feels a little bit like a, a bit of a lame duck format now, obviously. There, things are different with the bands, you know, CYB being gone and things like that. But with like the new set being like, what, like a month away and we're starting to, we're going to start getting spoilers here in like a week or two. It just, it just feels hard to get excited about class constructed at this point in time but good luck to everybody out there michael's going to be out there he's obviously as i if he can't record this podcast with me he's got to be somewhere and he's out there playing in friday side events as i call this winning i'm sure bountiful tickets in his preparation for the event so hopefully he comes back with some cool ticket tickety do swag and yeah, it's it's hard to cover a whole podcast by yourself. It's I've only been rambling for fifteen, not even fifteen minutes here, fourteen minutes. But I feel like I've already gone through so much, and I'm running out of things to say. A fun game I was thinking about playing was maybe going through and just answering thumbnail questions, or it's just like obviously a lot of thumbnails are very clickbaity. Like, is X Y Z broken? And I was just gonna be like, no. But. I don't know. That doesn't sound actually like a super fun game because, you know, everybody knows that they're clickbaity titles, so no reason to take them seriously. But I guess the clickbaity title that inspired it, though, was Does Classic Instructed Have a Hero Bloat Problem? Was the Arsenal Pass that was released today? I haven't listened to it yet. I'll probably listen to it coming up here shortly. But I don't think so. And I think that's borne out in the meta where it's hard for 30 heroes to be viable in a given meta. And so right now, sure, there's 30 some odd heroes, 29 some odd heroes that are legal and classic constructed, but 
a lot of them just are at such a drastically lower power level than the rest that they're just not really something you have to consider. And what's nice about that then is let's say you, you do love, you know, Tekla Vossen or, or Betsy or something like that, or there's a particular deck that, you know, you're, you want to get into in the game is you can start there knowing that you're going to have those heroes for longer, that they're not just going to shoot up in Living Legend overnight. Whereas if you come into the game or you're trying to like invest in a deck in something like Enigma, like there's a lot of risk in that right now. You know, she's at 600 points. She could easily be at more by the end of this weekend. And uh, there's no hopes of a uh, mystic illusionist anywhere in the near future. So we'll have to see, especially considering we still don't even have a replacement for the Draconic illusionist. And I think that's kind of the thing that's going to lead to, to bloat over time is that like I, I've been saying this for years now on the podcast, where as they introduce more class talent combinations of heroes, it's going to be harder and harder to keep those class talent combination heroes in the pool at the same time without having bloat. And um, Dice Commando even did a whole uh, discussion about living legend points and talked to James White about it recently where you know they weren't happy with the rate at which heroes were attaining the living legend status so they had to tweak the points and they, they're even bringing zen back in blitz now and what's interesting about that then is that there's no way that they're not going to have more and more heroes in the game over time because you're not going to have the same in and out ratio of heroes every year unless you start recycling old heroes, but that doesn't make sense because you can't. So <clears throat> if you look at something like out, uh, Outsiders, right, where they brought back Azalea or even Heavy Hitters where they brought back Reinar, well, that's all well and good for the heroes that like have low living legend points at the moment. But could you imagine like now if they brought back Azalea when she's already like halfway to living legend in a set? Like, or the, or them printing something like Icelander and a future, you know, ice set or something like that. It just, it wouldn't make sense to put them in that set if they're already living legends. So you can't, you can't just keep reusing the same heroes in order to, you know, alleviate the bloat. And so if you increase the velocity so that there's the same amount of heroes in and out in a year to kind of keep this balance going on, well, you have to start allocating more and more living legend points. And then that's also going to lead to not only um, heroes rotating out faster, and it, but that's not going to be the oldest heroes necessarily. That's still going to be the most powerful heroes, which could be as recent as like the most recent set. If we look at like, or the newer sets, like we look at the Mistvale heroes who are all, I think, just close if not over the 500 point threshold but you look at good old reinar from the first set or levia or bolton you know good old bolton are still well below 500 points and it's like okay obviously it's just really hard to keep a consistent schedule of these heroes while keeping the game new and engaging and interesting for players so i think as a consequence it will get to like the living not the living legend the league of legend status of the game where there's like 50 60 80 100 heroes legal and class construct at some point in time and the only thing that really hurts are you know content creators like me who have to make tier lists that are objectively correct every time because then there's a lot more heroes to rate but even then, what I can just what just will wind up happening. It'll be like here's a huge bucket of heroes that are probably bad. We'll just put them down in the bad bucket, and then we'll talk about the, the 15, 20 heroes that we think could be good or viable. And I think even saying like fifteen, twenty viable heroes, like could you imagine a meta like that? That would be insane. Like there's no way. I, I shouldn't say there's no way, but having fifteen to twenty viable heroes in a in a meta game is like the dream right where i guess as long as the games are good too but having that much diversity in like what the decks are doing 
or able to like play is really interesting. And I could see the frustration from like a pro player level, but like, well, like how do I account for like 15, 20 de decks and like the same 80 cards? But the thing that's interesting is that at the end of the day, a lot of them are still going to kind of break into like tr the traditional archetypes of card games, right? Where you're still always going to have, you know, control decks and you're going to have arcane damage decks and you're going to have aggro decks and you're going to have mid range decks and you're going to have setup decks and you're going to have ally decks. And as we see more and more tools that it like kind of like help generalize and helps specifically answer these types of decks. Like if you look at something like ripple away, right. Where you could play ripple away and, uh, it would be good into Enigma if you line it up right, and it's good into Azalea. And so that's a, a kind of like a hand trap hate card on a blue block three that kind of like lines up nicely into a couple different decks. And even like Warmonger's Diplomacy, where like traditionally it's pretty good into uh, decks like Azalea or Rune Blades, where they want to be playing the non attack actions or attack actions in the same turn. But like I said, that's already two classes and two different like hero archetypes that i've already covered with just like one hate card and so there's also been talk of things like you know sink below or potential of getting banned or something like that and i think if there were more heroes overall that were able to do things like present more consistent three like lower uh attack value numbers or have more arcane damage presented as part of their game plan that's our that's going to intrinsically lower the value of cards like sink below and paper scene anyways where you know maybe you don't need to play them all the time or you don't always need them to be around in 100 percent of the matchup so yeah i just think hero bloat not a real issue and i am all for our giant overlord future meta of million heroes but i think that's all i have in me for today my voice is starting to really rasp up up rasp up again and i'm holding back lots of coughs at the moment so the next time you have laryngitis always remember mind your manners thanks for watching